Hello, everybody. Hello, Abhijit. Very, very Hello. happy. Thank you for having me. Very honored to have you here in uh, Rencontre Économique Dex, uh, together with the set des Economistes. So we all know, uh, Abhijit, that you are Nobel Prize of uh, 2019, Economy Nobel Prize of 2019, together with uh, Esther Duflo. Uh, obviously, you are working on an extremely wide range of issues, either yourself or the JPAL, of which you are director, uh, so many topics we can discuss this morning. And as an addition... It's up to you. <laughs> as an addition, uh, uh, you've been kindly sharing the fact that you are even on the verge of publishing a cookbook. I have published a cookbook. It should come out in French soon. Uh -huh. So looking forward to this. Mm -hmm. uh, but maybe we will switch to more economic issues in the short run, and there yes. could be some links. Better. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, first, uh, first topic uh, uh, on your plate, on which you've been working a lot, the COVID, obviously a major worldwide crisis. What can you share with us on, uh, on this? So I think what we learned from, I think we did a, it was sort of when COVID happened, there was, for a moment we thought, okay, what do we do? Uh, because, you know, the usual mode of our research is to uh, interview people in person in and inter there were interventions in person and but things were not, everything was frozen. So and then we realized that in a sense it gave us a moment to rethink what we do and part of what we do, uh, we've always been doing but became much more important is thinking about how to do effective messaging. So we did a, a bunch of uh, uh, randomized control trials in the US uh, and in India uh, and in Europe uh, over, you know, about a one and a half year period, uh, basically trying to understand what, are, you know, who responds to what kind of message. And I think maybe we find this, the, the depressing answer is that the good news is that many people respond, including people who kind of based on other uh, less empirical approaches you might think will not respond. For example, U.S. white Republicans respond to messages from black doctors if you send them. So there's no, I, what was striking and maybe, and you know, where we, we did an experiment where we sent, uh, I'm going to say 27 million uh, text messages and in India and we find that people respond to them, they, they report their symptoms, they don't travel. It, it, it's, it's not, and we can use Facebook data to track them and to see if they are really traveling or not. So because the numbers are so huge, we can do all kinds of like, you know, Google Maps uh, data to just track down what's happening in the, so in the social network, who's moving where. And we see that, for example, if you tell people that, you know, don't go visit your grandparents because at Christmas because this year, you know, you might kill them uh, or something less, less obvious than that, but uh, they respond and you uh -huh. respond and you see effects on COVID infections and all kinds of things. So it it's really is quite powerful to, even though there were a million messages and some of the messages from the US uh, government itself was extraordinarily confusing um, and for most governments, but it's particularly Trump, you know, flailing around and that, had, that did damage. So if you had consistent, clear, there's also evidence that that did damage. So if you had consistent, clear messaging, people do respond, it does save lives. Mm -hmm. So it was, overall, it was a rather positive experience. And it didn't matter how you tailor the message, it was less about, you know, saying the right words, you know, dropping kind of race sensitive wor words to black populations. It wasn't that, they were really mm -hmm. quite happy to get pure information. Okay, so pure information, but targeted. Uh, targeted, well articulated, uh, articulated by people they would in general trust, mm -hmm. experts of some kind. Mm -hmm. That seemed to be a very conventional uh, maybe result, but it's one that we, we have five or six our cities and they all kind of consistently line up. So I'm, I'm pretty confident that it's, it, that there is a, I mean, even pretty basic information that's with the said without much flourish does does have an impact. Mm -hmm. That's very encouraging indeed. That, uh, yeah, indeed. The, yeah. the expert yeah. uh, words are are heard. 
did you did you try at all this kind of approach and or experiment in Europe? We did, and uh, you know, but on on vaccination, and we don't find much. But is vaccination mm -hmm. late in the day? It's maybe it was Europe has pretty good pa pa uh, penetration of vaccination, so it's mm -hmm. it's possible that this was little too, too little too late. Okay. Oh, very very interesting indeed. So moving out of COVID, we are of course. Uh, both facing short-term issues and longer-run issues. Short-term issue, the war in Ukraine, uh, refugees uh, that will be linked to this war in Ukraine, and of course, the increase in the price, uh, price of energy, scarcity, uh, also of uh, food and, uh, and rising food prices. Anything you, you want to share with us? So, so I, think, I think it's worth thinking about, I mean, the war in Ukraine. I, th I think there's a, there are people doing interesting uh, work on, you know, what can we do to help the, the refugees. Uh, I don't know whether it's you know, encouraging or discouraging, but I think the, uh, the re Ukrainian refugees um, seem to be much less, uh, receive much less hostile reception than, let's say, Syrian res refugees, I feel, I don't know whether they're, so in that sense it's an easier problem, it's one that depresses the hell out of me, the fact that there is this very racist reaction, uh, but it's, it's, it's what it is. Um, on the energy price, I would say that there's a sense in which I think food and energy prices need to be carefully separated, though, you know, they are causally linked to each other, for, uh, to the same causal factor. Uh, I think the energy prices, I think in the medium run, it's not bad for us to buy energy prices. We've been saying this for a while. The real challenge is how do you compensate the losers? I think this is where uh, I, I really do feel that, um, you know, much more, uh, you know, uh, taxing energy companies, uh, excess profits and redistributing them is, would be completely warranted, I, in my view. Uh, there's, this is a windfall coming from an awful event uh, that happened in the world, and I, there's no reason why you would pass on the profits to energy companies in, in, in this particular case. I think if they could find a way to target some taxation towards energy companies and take that money and redistribute it to the, to the many people who have been really hurt by it. So I, I, I think that is we want to not bring the prices down. We want to bring the income losses down. Uh, we want to contain the income losses. And I think that's, and that should be a matter of mostly of redistributive taxation of some kind. Mm -hmm. And I, I think we need to be, there is no, uh, I think the, uh, to me the answer is obvious. It's just, I don't know that anybody's has an, a set of instruments available. And that's part of what we, we've been saying for a while now. Uh, in our book from 2019, Good Economics for Hard Times, I think one of the central points we make is that redistributive mechanisms are not uh, someone, something we do as an afterthought. They are the justification for all the economic policy we do. Mm -hmm. And if we don't adopt that stance, then we'll get both of them wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, food prices, I think, is really a crisis. And it's really a crisis which at some level, the problem is food prices, sadly, are still too low in countries like the U.S. and China, uh, where, uh, you know, pigs are still being fed uh, corn that could, uh, wheat that could be fed to starving people in Africa. And it, it really is a crime. There's no two ways about it. This is, this is, uh, this is, I mean, we, if we can't save the, I mean, save the children had some number which were, uh, of, mm, Many million children who would die uh, from in the in the Horn of Africa, down going down into the uh, east, east, uh, you know, to into Uganda and and northern Uganda. These places are very poor. Uh, they're very, very, you know, dependent on. This year has also been extremely hot. The take combination of those two things is disastrous. I think for for many children and so I, I really think that this is, this is, if we find eventually that lots of children died because, uh, you know, we were too pusillanimous to whatever, to act on it, then it's, it's, it's really 
it's a, it's a real shame on humanity. I think we can solve this problem. It's a matter of, you know, whatever, uh, you know. Means in the end, it's true that food prices are high, but food, food, you know, budgets for most people in the West are a very small part of the income. If it went up for by 20 percent, there'll be a few percent increase in your spending, and you know, I, and it's not even going to go up for 20 percent. It's going to go up by five, six percent, and it's really not a. There's no justification for letting children die. Uh, uh, there. So I, I think the food is really where I, energy, I feel that there is a real case for aggressive action, but not less price controls than any, something else. And on, on the food side, I do think that we really need to act to get food to, especially into Africa. Mm -hmm. So as economists, uh, of course, there are things you can do and, and things you can say. Uh, so are these, are these issue of uh, food prices and the emergency of the food crisis uh, something you will actively uh, talk about in, in the debate? I, I, whenever I have a chance I talk about it. I don't see that it's, it's people, I, I do think that there's a, interesting the U.S. is, is, uh, has expanded its funding window for this, so the U.S. Uh, AID is, but I don't see a huge amount of action on on the European side. I would say the Europeans could open open their coffers a bit more to get uh, money that could be used by the uh, the uh, the organizations that are operating on the ground in these parts of Africa. So call for emergency action. Uh, Absolutely, worldwide. it is emergency, and it's this summer they will mm -hmm. die. Mm -hmm. It's not. We're not talking about. Uh, two years from now. I mean, there's all kinds of other bad things happening in the world, but this is really now. Very clear message. Thank you. And uh, it, it will be shared. Thank you. Uh, t turning to uh, maybe longer term structural issues, which are, of course, related. Uh, I mean, this all happens in an environment where we are facing some major social issues, some major issue for humankind. Mm. Uh, so two two topics that, uh, that are on my mind and that you have been working on a lot. Climate change on one side, I mean clearly there is a target of neutrality uh, by, by 2050 for, for the world. If we miss this target and if we, we don't uh, bring the temperatures sufficiently, uh, well the, the increase in temperature is sufficiently limited, we know that there will be incredible consequences on humankind, on moves of population, a lot of suffering. So clearly something we, we need to be able to succeed in, in the next few years, and it's, it, starts, uh, it has started already. It's really on our plate right now. And the other issue on a more social nature, the issue of uh, inequalities. So uh, if you agree, we, we can turn to one and then uh, no, then I mean, the they're other. not un unrelated. I, I, what I just said before is that I don't think we can, I think the, pro the reason partly we are dragging our feet in cl on climate change is that it's, it's, uh, uh, and you can see in this very clearly reflected in the, in the uh, Gilets Jaunes movement here, is a, is a very strong suspicion of the, uh, of the intentions of the government in terms of compensating people. There is no reason why the poor in France, who are the ones who don't live in metropolitan cities, don't use the public transport system, should pay for the, pay for the, uh, collective uh, ambitions of the country, and that's the the nature of uh, of the the carbon tax uh, conversation is too much that. So there's absolutely no reason to stop there, and uh, or there, uh, you know, I think so. I think the inequality, and in particular the question of compensation, is central to the question of dealing with climate change. I think politically, the basis for for action has to be uh, very clearly connected to. Uh, a real credible commitment to compensating people. And if we don't take that together, I think we will actually miss the boat on both. Mm -hmm. So I, I, do, I do think that we need to be, and I think that comes with a, a more general shift towards a less uh, patronizing attitude towards uh, poor people. I think it's, you know, it's not, this, is not, this is not that we are being nice to them. 
we are taking their money away mm -hmm. in the name of some collective goal, which may be laudable, which I support. But we are, is, we are taking their money away for no, without really getting their permission. So well, why, why is it, I think we need to also change the conversation around uh, redistribution. I think redistribution is uh, much more about uh, just being fair and reasonable than about, uh, you know, some social gen generosity of some kind. I uh, fully agree on this, huh? I think. Uh, but by, by now, I would say Europe has learned uh, probably a bit uh, the hard way, and we're mentioning the gilet jaune, the fact that uh, indeed the distributing uh, effects of uh, taxation, and in particular of uh, taxation of energy, need to be taken into account as uh, well, when you design the policy. Correct. It's not exactly. a second thought. Exactly. It has to be, uh, it has to be, it exactly. has, it has exactly. to be central. Yeah. And I think. Now we know this, and we heard this morning uh, the Minister of Finance saying we will fully use the, the receipts from, uh, from energy taxation to uh, compensate uh, the most vulnerable. So that's, uh, that's clearly a step uh, addressing what you're, you're saying. Uh, and, but and we it, need some mechanisms for doing it. Actually, yeah. I mean, France is not well designed to actually address the most vulnerable. It just the, the structure of public spending is not designed for that. We really need to think, take over, build the entire public finance around it. Yeah, to, to, I mean, I've, I've looked at a bit at this in, uh, in some previous work. I was uh, working as chief of staff of the Minister of Finance. We have many redistribution tools, but it's very, it's, uh, as you say, not, not easy to compensate the losers of a precise thing, which is the rise in price of energy. Because when you look at it, and you mentioned it, there is a lot of heterogeneity between households, among yeah. urban households uh, versus non-urban households. Some have uh, a, a tremendous uh, public transportation offer, others have no choice. So it's, it's, it's not an easy to design policy, yeah. Yeah. Fully, fully agree. Yeah. Uh, but if we can expand a bit uh, here the, the, the framework, we talk about France. We see some progress in Europe, by the way, on uh, the price of carbon and what will be its scope. There was a, a decision by, uh, by the ministers uh, a few, few days ago. Uh, a question I have for you, and uh, of course you have one step, uh, well, you have several steps on several continents, let's put it this way. <laughs> Probably more than two legs at this stage. It's easy to fall down when you do that. <laughs> no, it makes you more stable. Oh, yeah. We had more legs, yes. You, you have lots of legs on different mm -hmm. continents. Uh, in particular, you know the US very well. I mean, one, uh, you were mentioning food prices in the U.S. Uh, we could also talk about uh, the, what the U.S. are doing in terms of uh, energy saving. Because clearly, there is a, when we look at the per capita emissions of CO2, uh, the, the U.S. are clearly uh, the elephant in the room. Yeah, yeah. So what are your thoughts here? Well, I, think, I mean, I think right now I'm deeply pessimistic about uh, the U.S. because I think the U.S. politics has drifted to a place where, I mean, uh, the, su the recent Supreme Court judgment saying that the EPA is not really uh, empowered to basically deal with climate change, that, uh, that truly, uh, that's truly awful. I mean, and, and the U.S. Supreme Court is truly awful. There's nothing, uh, you know, you can't, there's no two ways to describe them other than a bunch of monsters, but whatever. Uh, you know, they, so I, I, I'm not optimistic about the U.S. because the politics in the U.S. seems to be drifting to the right very quickly. Uh, I think the Democrats are expecting to lose the House of Representatives, at which point they will not be able to pass any budget, budget resolutions. So I, I don't see anything easy happening there. I mean, I really think that uh, it's it, the U.S. Uh, is. Uh, I mean, it seems to be, despite, I think, uh, more and more, I mean, what is interesting is the U.S., or even in the U.S., the public awareness of an acceptance that climate change is happening has gone up, mm -hmm. and gone up quite a lot. Uh, surprisingly, it's less that than a lack of general trust in government. Mm -hmm. And if you trust, don't trust government, then you think everything is whatever you, the government does is always bad and therefore there's no point in in uh, trying mm -hmm. i think it's a, it's a deep pessimism about at least among you know the the ideological rich uh, uh, in the i don't really take their opinion seriously they're just protecting their pocketbooks they're awful mm -hmm. but i think the 
people I have some sympathy for are the, uh, the relative low income people in the middle of America. And they're all uh, the people who will vote Republican, who will turn this policy, make the, it's impossible. But I don't think their primary impetus is, uh, is you know, some of them are whatever, uh, you know, they believe that uh, the kingdom come, come is tomorrow, therefore they have no reason to be concerned. Others are maybe uh, libertarian, but there's a whole bunch of them who actually now accept that there is something wrong. They just don't trust the government. And that, that to me is, at the heart of a lot of the what what we have failed over the last 20 years is mm -hmm. somehow to convince people that the government trust in government has been declining secularly, mm -hmm. and I think this is central to where where we are because I think it's till we can convince people that indeed when the government says we can do something and that will compensate you that this is all credible. Mm -hmm. and it's it's a really deep suspicion of of. Uh, all of these as elite projects that will just screw the poor. And I think that there it goes back to what I was saying about Europe. There's a broader general lack of credibility in government, which is partly a result of, you know, of the, uh, of the I think, the systematic failure of governments to, to address uh, the, the, I think, legitimate concerns of a lot of poor people. I, I do think that there is a, this is not, Accidental, and in mm -hmm. the U.S., I think it's given the structure, the decentralized structure of the U.S. I think this is going to be a particularly big problem. So I'm, I'm not hugely optimistic about the U.S. moving in the right direction in, in the next two years, mm -hmm. uh, at least. Let's see what I mean. God knows after that. Okay. Now, at the same time, we see. I mean, that there's a bit of a paradox in the U.S. Uh, which are, I mean, overall still a very, uh, very high level of emissions and, uh, and, and, and difficult to see the path for them to really converge on, the, on, on, on serious climate change objectives. At the same time, there is action no? in, in the sense of uh, this is a place where renewables can be developed very quickly, where, uh, where, where there are some support schemes uh, which, uh, which help this development of renewables. So, think, Things are moving in the right direction. Yeah, I think things are moving somehow in the right direction, but they will move much more through the supply side than mm -hmm. from the demand side. Mm -hmm. I think the demand side actions, I mean, the reaction to the current carbon prices in the U.S. are so politically toxic that it's, I, I, I doubt that this is about to be the the instrument of choice. So I, the acting on the demand side is going to be hard. The supply side, in some sense, I think, is for the U.S., that's where, as you say, there is, there is action. The government is, one thing the U.S. is open to is if somebody can make money, let them make money. And one thing that I think the improvement of technology has done is it made, made it possible to move to renewables and make money, mm -hmm. as you know well. Mm -hmm. So I, 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 think, I think that's great, and that, but that's the only thing. I don't think it's going to be on the, on the demand side policies, which Europe, I think, will take much more seriously. Mm -hmm. I think the demand side policies I don't see as being a big part of the next years, few years in the US. This, this episode of $5 gas, Mm -hmm. uh, which, of course, in Europe would be cheap, uh, is has been so so negatively received. F five dollar per gallon, right? Yeah, yeah, per, uh, per gallon. So a gallon is how many liters? Three point five three or something. Yeah. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. so that's less than one fifty probably. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> exactly. Just to, to help uh, the watch yeah, 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 conversion. Yeah. 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 The other push factor, I guess, in the U.S. are the stakeholders, the investors. We see a number of big corporates who are, who are embarking on decarbonation. But, 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 but I think all, all of those. And this that, demand part. I think that's all, yeah, maybe uh, true. Of big I, ones. We'll, we'll see. I mean, I, mm. I don't know how much of their imprint. It, it, it's also nice for them to say. It. I, we'll see what they do. Okay. Mo moving uh, maybe to our, uh, to, to our last, uh, last topic uh, medium term issue, well, short term and medium term issue the issue of inequalities, uh, on which you've worked a lot. 
so what are your thoughts on are we is the situation improving? I mean, we lived for a long time with the idea that the globalization were, was reducing inequalities across countries, across countries, but not within countries. Uh, what can you what can you share with us? Well, uh, you know, again, uh, you know, I think that there is, I think, uh, the fundamental force that uh, I feel is uh, we is increasingly evident is this uh, fact that the returns to scale in this globalized world are enormous. So a few corporations are really set to kill. And I, I do think that this is, so I don't think, I mean, I, I think that framing somehow suggests that these are autonomous processes. Each country is growing and the poorer countries are growing. They're getting more unequal, some, some Kuznets curve or something. Mm -hmm. I think that story is fundamentally flawed. I, I do think that it's, there is a sense in which a, we are constructing a global elite who of, with mobile companies, mobile people, and that these are actually the agents of massive inequality. They, they are creating you know, a, a new class of globally, uh, globally paid employees all over the world. And, so I, I, and, but also they are, you know, I'm petrified by the thought of what happens if the retail sector in, you know, in Kenya uh, gets uh, entirely killed by, is this, that's one of the few free entry industries that exist. Mm -hmm. So you, you buy Amazon. I mean, it really is, a, is a, I, I, at some point we really need to say that, look, we, we have very poor compensatory mechanisms. Uh, you know, there are a few things that people can do to survive. And we are, we, we sort of, as economists, we seem to be blind to the dangers of letting, uh, you know, the Amazons of the world take over. Mm -hmm. I, so I, I, I'm quite, uh, I, I do think that we should be, uh, this, I think that narrative is, uh, forgets that it's not just that, you know, globalization creates opportunities, each country uh, takes advantage mm -hmm. of it. The globalization is creating opportunities for a few big companies, mm -hmm. and those companies are going to be extraordinarily profitable. They are becoming extraordinarily profitable. I don't know that that's good for the rest of the world. I don't know how, what one does about it either because they seem too powerful to, but I, I, I think we need to be more um, upfront about the fact that this, the, the, the returns to scale built into the today's kind of homogeneous, you know, the growing inequality uh, also feeds a particular demand for global products mm -hmm. and global products therefore are then delivered by these companies and uh, you know the local artisan and the local uh, uh, shopkeeper are just don't can't keep up so mm -hmm. i really think we are in a very dangerous place mm -hmm. inequality wise so yeah so your message is really uh, let's look at, at the particular impact of globalization the role of big corporates in particular when when they could destroy part of the economy that was uh, as you say low low entry cost and uh, and enabling a, a, a large population, in, especially in, uh, in emerging countries, to, uh, to, yeah. to have a living and to, yeah. and to survive. Uh, no, that's, uh, that, that's a clear point. On, uh, I mean, turning, so, that, so one, uh, one aspect is probably competition and uh, regulation uh, yeah. on, the, uh, on this side. Uh, turning to more social policies, something on, uh, something on education uh, that should be done? I mean, I think lots of, I think the pandemic was uh, was in a sense uh, eye opener for uh, on both sides. I think on one side it was uh, it very clearly demonstrates that schools are for for people who don't have the opportunities of having very educated parents with access to every technology. Schools are tremendously valuable. I think that's something we learned quite resoundingly there and for that it cre increased education inequality massively. Mm -hmm. The other thing that uh, it also told us is that on the other hand the technology is ex extraordinarily powerful and I think that I'm hoping still and I, I try to be an optimist uh, uh, that this will actually lead to uh, some innovations that will be more broad based mm -hmm. um, that in a sense um, and I, you know, I, I, I'm, 
I still feel optimistic that this will happen and this there will be, it's not that the existing school systems in developing countries are working so well. Mm -hmm. So I, I do think that trying to do better would be also be a good thing. Okay. So technology as a possible tool for uh, helping, uh, help, helping rise, the quality, rise the quality of education in, uh, yeah. in this country. Okay, so maybe we can stop on this uh, optimistic note. Yes, please. <laughs> so thank you, thank you very much, uh, you, Abhijit. That was, uh, that was really interesting and I think we, we covered a lot together. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.